Hey everybody, welcome to a special edition of CAF's Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Babbitt, co-founder of the Challenge Athletes Foundation, and this is our road to Tokyo. Our next guest, four-time Paralympian, five Paralympic medals, two gold, two silver, one bronze, Mr. Rudy Garcia Tolson. How are you doing, Rudy? I'm great. How are you, Babbitt? I am awesome. So uh, you've got potentially going for your fifth Paralympics. Yep. But you retired in 2016. You did, did track and you swam and you're like, I'm done. I'm going to get a real job, which you did yep. with New York Roadrunners. Yep. Talk about how the heck you ended up going for a fifth Paralympics. Sure, sure. Yeah. So after my last Paralympic Games in Rio, uh, I was feeling a little burnt out with the pool. Uh, I spent, you know, 20 years training and, and competing at the high level. And I just felt like it was about that time to potentially move on and try something different. So I moved out to New York City after the Rio Paralympic Games. And the focus was to have a different focus outside of sports. And I, I got into swim coaching to begin with. And then I started working at a triathlon studio, mm -hmm. uh, doing coaching there. And then I got a role working with the New York Roadrunners uh, with their youth disability program. And I was essentially in charge of their wheelchair training program for a little more than two years. And uh, it was it was a definitely a different world. You know, I would go into the office and I would have my desk and go in for meetings. And like, I really felt like I was grown up. I felt like, like uh, you know, that, that my sports life was over and that it was not time to switch gears and do right. something different. And yeah. I was enjoying it. I love working with kids, especially kids with disabilities. Uh, I feel that I can relate to them uh, in, a, in a unique way. Uh, so I was really enjoying New York City and, and really, you know, getting the lay of the land. And that's essentially when COVID took over. And that was back in March of 2020. And one day we were working in the office and the next day we were working from home. And it seemed like it was not going to end. It, there was no end in sight. And around the same time, back in April, was when they announced that the Paralympics and the Olympics were going to be postponed one full year because of the pandemic. And when I heard this news, I mean, I, I remember instantly thinking, well, shoot, now maybe, maybe I have a shot. Maybe, maybe I have the time to try to go back. And it was... For me, it, it was a decision It took me about a week to figure out because a part of me felt like leaving New York and going back into training in Colorado Springs was almost like taking a step back. Yeah. I, I didn't want to move backwards in life. I wanted to continue to evolve. But I also realized that I'm 32 years old now. I'm not getting any younger. If there was a time to go for it, now is the time. And so back in March of, of, uh, of 2020, I decided to essentially quit my job in New York City uh, and and pursue this crazy goal of going for my fifth Paralympics in Tokyo. And you move out to the Springs, yeah. right? And yeah. But originally you were trying to get in, uh, go to the Olympic Training Center, I which was. you had been based before, but they had a full roster, yeah. right? Yeah. And you no spot for it. I had a full roster. The Olympic Training Center was, was a full roster program that was already running very successful. And because I didn't swim since Rio, I essentially had no uh, proof to stand on to show them that, listen, guys, like I still I can still be fast. I can still make national team standards. I can still work my way up in the world rankings. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, they, they weren't very receptive on, on giving me an opportunity to train at the center. So I essentially had to start training at Lifetime Fitness. Uh, I have uh, two, two teammates who I train with uh, almost on a daily basis, Roderick Sewell and Emily Gray. And essentially, uh, it's Lifetime Fitness is where I started my training for Tokyo. Um, and it is, it's, it's a little bit of an untraditional training environment because while I'm in the pool, you know, knocking out my, you know, 5,000 meter workout, the, in the lane next to me, there's the, the young ladies doing water aerobics and they have their music blasting and they're cheering and dancing. And then here I am, you know, focusing on, on, on the next set and the next uh, interval. Uh, so it's not your traditional training situation, but I think, uh, I think as a Paralympic athlete, uh, you just have to adapt. You have to figure out a way to get it done. And if COVID has taught me anything, uh, if, if COVID, the pandemic, and just trying to make a comeback, it's taught me that you have to focus on what you can control. Uh, and, and, you know, for me, uh, when I first started the comeback, I was, I, was work, I was living in New York City. And in New York City during the pandemic in 2020, there were no pools available. 
So I, I did what I could and I started running. Uh, we started, I started running uh, about one hour a day uh, and I would go out at nighttime, usually around 10, 11 o'clock at night when there was nobody in the street. So I had the streets of Bro Brooklyn I was running on and I did that for about a month and then I decided that it was time to continue to move. So I went out to California and when I first got to California, I was in the same situation. I had nowhere to train, no, no water. So I figured, you know what, I'm going to do what I can. So I started driving to the ocean every day and started surfing. Uh, it got a little, a little bit of cross training in, but anybody knows you can't train in the ocean for a pool event. So uh, around the same time, uh, I got an invitation to come out and swim at David Duchovny's uh, private pool in Malibu. The actor. And the actor. And I, I couldn't refuse. It was a one lane, 25 yard pool uh, all to myself. And I was uh, thankful enough to, to be able to go there six days a week. The challenge with that was I had to drive two hours one way uh, to get to Malibu from Riverside and typically two to three hours on the way home. So uh, it really forced me to want it. It really forced me to, um, to not have any excuses because one excuse and I could have been taking the day off or, you know, I just... I could have very easily fell off of you know the the plan to get to Tokyo. So you know while I was training in David's pool for three months, about three months, I more focused on just getting back into the pool and feeling what it was like to swim for an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, and and I, most importantly, I was focused on not overdoing it, not getting an injury because I had really I have no time for injuries. You know we have no time. I have no time to be out of the pool. Everything's going to be everything is, needs to be very calculated and, and, and training smart. And that's what I did uh, while I was training there at David's, David's pool. And again, I got the hunch that I needed to keep moving. Uh, so back in November is when I originally moved out back out to Colorado Springs. And uh, that's what, exactly when I started training at Lifetime Fitness. And, and, and really training at Lifetime Fitness since November has, has gotten me to this point. Well, we're now in almost at the end of May, and we have trials coming up uh, in about four weeks, and um, and that's where it's all going to come down to essentially is is swimming fast at trials. So, so the the interesting part to me is one, you have to get classified. Yeah. Right. Yep. To get classified, you had to be swimming for this last couple of years. Yep. You haven't been doing it. Yep. So then, and then to you also have to go swim yeah. and get a qualifying time yep. for 200 IM or yep. 100 breast. And the only meet you found that was a USA para swim sanction event yep. was in Indiana. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> essentially my, my, my comeback into competitive swimming and Paralympics uh, was going to start in Louisville, Texas at the first Paralympic meet yep. that has happened since COVID hit. And I, I realized about four weeks away from this competition that I needed to have a qualifying time just to enter into the meet. Right. Because as it stands, I wasn't going to be able to, to swim in this Louisville Paralympic meet. So essentially, I was on a scavenger hunt trying to find a competition uh, that was a long course meter that was USA Swimming Certified. Uh, and that was somewhere in my area that I can get to. And thankfully, I've had, I've had some, some gr really great friends in, in USA Swimming, and they were able to point me in, in the direction of uh, sectionals, speedo sectionals that were happening in Indianapolis uh, at the end of March. And, and I reached out to the meet director, and she, she was very, um, very accommodating, mm -hmm. but there was one speculation that, that what, what I had to do, and that was I couldn't fly to Indianapolis. I had to drive, which from Colorado Springs to Indianapolis is 17 hours. So because otherwise you had a quarantine. Otherwise I had a quarantine. I would have had a two week quarantine, and, and I, I was talking to the meet director two weeks before. Right. So there was no two way weeks. I was gonna quarantine, no way I could fly in because that was a, a University of Indiana policy, so essentially, I had to get into my car and drive 17 hours uh, to swim uh, to just to get a qualifying time, which I, I could have very easily swam in practice uh, right. with no warm up. Just go in and, and get it. But you know, these these are some of the challenges that I, I had to I had to um, to overcome and 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 figure out how it was going to get done and then I execute it. Uh, so driving, you know, 34 hours just to get a qualifying time. In your time, this is a two minute and 45 second race. Two minute and 44 second I swam, which was still a national team standard. So it was almost like a moment where, you know, I kind of realized that I wasn't too far off. You know, I actually had, I 
had some athletic athleticism in there. And uh, having my first competition in March, where I, I really started training about six months before, uh, I, I knew I was in a really good place. I knew that I was doing what I needed to do. Uh, and, and essentially swam that race in Indianapolis, which enabled me to swim in Louisville uh, three weeks later. And in Louisville, you swam your MSQ. And in, Lu in Louisville, I, I swam the 200 IM and the 100 breaststroke. And in the 100 breaststroke, I was able to make my uh, minimum, minimum qualifying standard for Tokyo, uh, which is one of the requirements to even be considered uh, to, to be nominated to the Paralympic team. So being able to go down to Louisville and swim uh, a 126.3, uh, and the MQS was a 126.5, so I literally just made it. But you know, to, uh, to me, I, I made it, and then that's that. That was the mo that was the important part of of that process of going to Louisville, swimming uh, a, na uh, a minimum qualifying standard, and really letting the coaches and and everybody know that you know I'm here, I'm swimming fast, I feel great, and and I want to go even faster. So back in the day, when you were part of the Paralympic program, yeah, right? You're at yeah. the training center, yeah. everything's planned for you, the coach is giving you the workout, you're sort of floating through and yeah. doing what you need to do. Yeah. How has all of this changed you? Because you're, you have to be your own coach, yeah. you have to be your own, I gotta be here at this time. And at the same time, people are saying, no, it doesn't matter how fast you swim, you're not going to the Paralympics. Sure. No, you're never gonna get classified to go. Dealing with sort of the, the roadblocks, yeah. has that helped you become a different Rudy Garcia told? Absolutely. This whole process of going for Tokyo, uh, as you mentioned, my whole swimming career from 2004 to 2016, I've always had a coach telling me what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And that's worked out great for me. I, 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 I'm, I'm a very coachable athlete and I'm, I listen very well and I'm able to do exactly what coach tells me. And it's been very successful uh, throughout my whole career. But this time around for Tokyo, um, I, I really had to, had to listen to myself. I had to coach myself. I had to create a plan that was gonna get me to Tokyo and I did this all by myself. I didn't have no outside support, no outside coaches helping me. Uh, I essentially had to use what I've learned over the past 20 years as a professional swimmer and apply it firsthand. And, and at the end of the day, that the part that was, 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 was empowering for me was that throughout my whole training, being training at David's pool to training at Lifetime Fitness, you know, I have full control over what, what practice is and how it's gonna go and the outcome. And to me as an athlete, that, that's, that's a very empowering situation to have full control over what you're doing and, and not, to, not to have somebody telling you what to do. Uh, and so for me, it's that the dynamic has definitely changed just for going for Tokyo. Uh, I feel I'm a better athlete for it. I'm a better athlete because I have to figure out how to make it work and, and it's all on me. So I don't have anybody to blame or anybody to, to, uh, to, to bounce it off of. And, you know, for me going for Tokyo at, at the age of 32, I'll be 33 in Tokyo. Um, it's, it's been very empowering because it's, it, there's, there's no, no, I can't lay the blame or the excuse on anybody else but myself. And that to me is, is awesome as an athlete. You've been part of the CAA family since you were seven, eight yeah. years old, yeah. and now you're 32. Yeah. This last number of years, um, how, you know, when New York Roadrunners goes away and a lot of yeah. other stuff goes away, how yeah. important is CAF then? You know, CAF has been, as you mentioned, CAF has been with me since I started uh, this, this, this uh, Paralympic venture, this adaptive sports venture, just CAF has been there since the start of really my life. You know, they've, they've, they've been there since, you know, I was seven, eight years old. And they supported me since I was seven or eight years old. And, you know, I grew up in a trailer park. You know, my dad worked at a truck stop. My mom took care of us, us four kids. You know, I grew up in, in a trailer. And, you know, one, one of the biggest challenges as a, as a seven, eight year old getting to races that were in Los Angeles or San Diego was transportation. Right. And my dad had a 1960 Ford pickup that, that broke down quite a lot. And one of the, the ma first major ways that CAF supported me was by giving my family transportation. They, you guys gave us yeah, a van yeah. Yeah. where we were able to travel to San Diego and, and make it there on time and make it to the races where I can continue to chase this 
this uh, this sports venture of mine. And and even even today, you know, I'm going for my fifth Paralympic Games. I'm 32 years old now, and CAF is still stuck by me, uh, and they've they've supported me uh, to get gets me where I am. Because I mean, I can tell you. Um, being, being, having sponsors in the past, you know, they come and go, but CAF has always stood by my side and they've really allowed me to, to train full time, you know, cause if it wasn't for CAF, I would be out driving Uber or driving Instacart just to try to make some extra funds for myself to get to these competitions. Because, um, you know, I, as we know, Tokyo in, in, in the light of Tokyo for 2020, I was very late in the game. Right. I, you know, at, at this point last year, the Paralympic teams were almost already named. Right. And for them to be postponed and then to me to come back out of retirement, uh, the sponsors uh, that are usually there for the Paralympics were not there this time around. So uh, I really had to um, really, really had to budget and figure out how I was going to do it. And with CAF support, I was able to get it done. So when you go to the trials in Minneapolis yeah. and you look around and you see Roderick Sewell yeah. and you see David Gelfand and yeah. you see Cody McCaslin and you see Haven Shepard, yeah. all of these kids who basically got into swimming because of you sure. and because of CAF swim clinics, yeah. how does that make you feel? It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. I mean, for me, being able to go to the trials, go to the nationals and see Cody McCaslin uh, start college, being a freshman in college, swimming for his college you see Roderick Sewell finish an Ironman and come back and, and, and tr potentially make Tokyo for two sports. Uh, to see Haven Shepard just swim very fast and, and David Gelfin. I mean, all these, all these kids that I'm talking about, I, 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 I grew up with them. And we were, age-wise, I was always a little bit older. So they were always the little new CAF athletes. And to see them now, you know, graduating high school, being in college, chasing the Paralympic, you know, dreams, uh, it's, it's what it's all about. You know, medals and records and making a team, that's all great and everything. It, 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 it makes me feel good. But I think what makes me feel even like we're doing something very impactful is seeing these, seeing these young kids show up to trials and, and, and go for the Paralympic Games. I mean, that is what it's all about because it's the journey and it's the process that are making these kids uh, grow up to be something very special. That being said, what would it mean to you to make your fifth Paralympic team? Uh, to, to make my fifth Paralympic teams, it, it will be, uh, I'll be very proud of myself because, it, you know, this whole, this whole uh, cycle for going for Tokyo has been nothing but setbacks. It's been nothing but uh, obstacles and challenges and, and a lot of reasons why I, I, I wasn't going to be able to make it. So for me to make Tokyo and, and to go for my fifth Paralympic Games, um, it, it's just, it, to me, it's, it's, it embodies what us Paralympic athletes go through on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, there's a lot of obstacles that no one sees. There's a lot of challenges that, that you, you just don't, you know, think about. And, and we as Paralympic athletes, as challenge athletes, we, we deal with these on a daily, daily basis. So for me, I, I, I embrace the challenges. I embrace, you know, the negativity. Uh, it's a way for me to fuel myself and, you know, I think it's just going to be, um, I'll be very proud and, and also I think it'll, it'll be awesome for, for CAF. It'll be awesome for all the little, little Rudies that are out there who want to make, you know, the Paralympics or do an Ironman. You know, I, I want them to know that, you know, even, even if after you've done the Paralympics, you could still go back and, 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 and swim fast. And the goal, the goal is not to make the team. The goal is to get on the podium. So. Love it. And if you're on the podium. Why be looking up at anybody? Exactly. You got to be on number one. <laughs> All right. Rudy Garcia Tolson has been our guest again. This is our Challenge Athletes Foundation Road to Tokyo. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.